Hi, my name's Lori Glover. I'm an, an historian of the 18th century. I work uh, at St. Louis University, and I'm here today with Charlene Boyer Lewis, who's from Kalamazoo College. Her most recent book is Elizabeth um, Patterson Bonaparte, an American aristocrat in the early republic. Um, and I'm also with George Boudreau, who is a Philadelphia-based historian, but coming to us from Maine. And he is the author of uh, Independence, A Guide to Historic Philadelphia. They are together the editors of a fantastic new collection of original research essays called Women in George Washington's World. It appeared just last month with the University of Virginia Press. And we're all very excited to be together um, with the National Archives. Thanks so much to them for sponsoring the event. Uh, and it's particularly important that we are with the National Archives because all of the contributors to the essays worked either uh, in manuscript holdings at the National Archives or with the digital projects uh, sponsored by National Archives, particularly uh, Founders Online. So uh, hello, George uh, and Charlene. And we're just going to dive right into discussing the book, which brought together 10 different contributors working across different subfields. Um, and maybe we could start with um, what you all learned in the process of working with so many different uh, authors and, and maybe some of the challenges of, of working with that many different scholars. I'll start. Uh, what George and I had really hoped to have a book that would have a broad range of voices. And so he, intent, he and I intentionally set out to invite all the specific historians who we wanted involved. And I think it lived up to our, our expectations. George and I had very high expectations for this book and everybody did such a wonderful job. And what we really, what I really learned is I thought, well, everybody says, don't ever edit a book. It's a nightmare. Don't ever edit a book, right? It's like hurting cats. We had the most fantastic contributors. Um, and the thing that I learned is that they all brought the strengths that George and I had wanted them to bring. They all did. And so everybody did, wrote these amazing essays. They were all really committed to the project. They were all really good workers. They all paid attention to deadlines. Um, so my lesson was editing a book is actually a good experience. Yeah, my, my experience, Charlene, is that you learn a lot about history with, that you thought you knew, but you don't really know. And you learn a lot about writing um, because each person brings their own um, emphasis and skill and, um, and, and nitpicky things which make you a, a stronger writer. What about you, George? Well, I've been an editor for a long time. Uh, when I started graduate school, one of the things I said I wanted to do was edit. Uh, and I was the editor of my college paper in Manchester and in Indiana and several other things. But um, I, I, I was struck in this that we really didn't have uh, a major issue, that everyone was very committed to the idea. And we're very lucky that we were unified in some ways around people and themes and organizations. Um, this book grew out of uh, a weekend that many of us spent together at Mount Vernon at the Fred W. Smith library for the study of George Washington uh, in, a, in a conference symposium put together by their wonderful director of programs, a man named Stephen McLeod and Kevin Butterfield, their head of the library, and Doug Bradburn and, uh, and Susan Scholler and others were very much a part of getting this organized and letting it form into our minds. And one of the great things about the creation of these study centers, like like the Washington Center, like the International Center for Jefferson Studies and others, is it's really giving people a, a place to come together and have conversations and see uh, how ideas don't work well together, but more important, how they do. Um, one of the things I thought most of in my six months living at Mount Vernon was, what a great thing it is to get to have nightly or weekly conversations or lunches or periodically when someone makes a great find leaping up at a library table and running into the next table and working with the staffs there. Mount Vernon has an unbelievable professional staff of historians and uh, archaeologists, uh, architects, curators, librarians, etc. And all of these contributed to this. And as you'll see in 
my contribution to the book. At one point, uh, the head guide was taking me through the house to see Martha Washington's lived experience as she arrived at the little Mount Vernon house at the time of her marriage and to really get into those experiences. So we had, uh, we, as Charlene just said, we had a tremendous collection of authors, um, some of whom were part of that symposium, several weren't. There, a bunch of this book is, is brand new. Um, and that we got to get for people at various stages in their careers uh, who were all interested in telling these women's stories. So I know um, I know it began with this conference and what, what a privilege to be able to gather at Mount Vernon. So you all are the editors of the scholarship of 10 of your colleagues. But then at some point, Nadine Zimmerly, who's at the University of Virginia Press, became your editor. When did UVA Press get involved? Well, Charlene had met her first. Uh, Nadine and I, I, I don't think Nadine and I have ever met face to face. And I have very fond memories of the day I called her we, to pitch the book. Uh, and I sat next to the river in uh, Old City, Alexandria, uh, explaining to her that I needed to be somewhere with good cell service. Um, but Nadine's a phenomenal history editor and was a great contributor and part of this in, in moving things along and getting the book. It's a very attractive volume. People keep telling us how much they love our cover, which they did this brilliant graphic of the Udon bust of, of George Washington in silhouette with uh, five women's faces uh, looking out from Washington. Um, uh, and so we were... Uh, I guess if I, I'll brag a moment and say, as we sat by the fireplace in the DeVos Scholars Residence at Mount Vernon, I said to Charlene and other women at the conference, this is a book. You know, this, these cling together. This re could read as a narrative. Someone could sit down and read this. Um, and as she said, she called a few days later to volunteer. And as I've uh, confessed, I had been, I'd spent days trying to think of a way to nag her into being my co-editor. I prefer to work collaboratively. Uh, so she has the great expertise in early American women, something I still feel I'm a bit of a novice at. Um, but wow, did I learn a lot from my contributors in this book. Well, what and just and jokingly doubling, back, doubling back a second, it, it is a, a beautifully uh, put together book. I always think that old saying that you can't judge a book by its cover is really inaccurate. You can learn quite a lot from a book uh, about its cover, uh, uh, by its cover. Uh, and there's that sort of beautiful design on the front of your book. What it doesn't convey is the um, intention you all had of bringing together both academic historians and public historians. And you two in your own scholarly careers reflect that trajectory. But I think one of the signal um, achievements and, the, and, the, and a unique part of the collection is that interweaving of public historians' writings with academic historians' writings. And I wondered if you might just reflect for a moment uh, with the audience about what value you found that added to the collection overall. Well, George and I was very, we were both very intentional about this. Um, and it's also the fact that the public historians who are involved in the volume are the experts on the women about whom they wrote. So it wasn't even that difficult to say, well, do we want you know, a professor at a university like me, or do we want a public historian you know, like, like that George is currently? It's just that these were the experts. And so when George and I were thinking about the historical female figures we wanted in the volume, I knew immediately who it was who had to get involved. Um, and, and so it ended up about half the contributors are public historians and about half are academics. And I think it'd be a challenge for people to figure out who's who, right? Um, because they're all wonderfully written. That was another goal of the volume that George and I had. We wanted this to be incredibly readable, lively, um, just everybody wanted to tell a good story and they did and so the storytelling aspect is something that george and i really focused on and public historians just by the very nature of their job know how to tell good stories they have to tell good stories to get people to come to their historic sites or to read their public volumes like the adams papers or the papers of martha washington 
they have to be good at that. As you and I know, academics don't always have to be good at storytelling. Um, but the academics that we got involved were also, like Cynthia Kerner, right, a very, 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 Kay Hallman, very committed to telling really good stories. So I, I don't, I don't, I mean, we did want to go with an academic press. We wanted this to be peer reviewed. You know, we wanted it to, to be able to stand right up there with any academic scholarly work. We wanted this to be a scholarly book, but with a public audience and the public historians we brought in were phenomenal. So uh, let me just reintroduce if, if people are uh, joining. Uh, I'm with Charlene Boyer Lewis and George Boudreaux, who are the editors of the new volume Women in George Washington's World out last month uh, with the University of Virginia Press. And so, you know, let's sort of dive into um, who are those women on the cover? Who are the women in Washington's world that we might not expect? I mean, I think most people know there's, there's going to be a chapter uh, about Martha Washington. Uh, there's going to be a chapter about uh, Ona Judge. But who are some of the other, I guess, sort of more surprising women that readers are going to meet uh, when they buy the volume? Well, one of the one of the things that I'm really pleased about is we did bring in uh, authors from a spectrum of, of uh, moments in careers. And one of the exciting things for me was Samantha Snyder's extremely new work on Elizabeth Willing Powell, who is sort of, she is George Washington's nose on the front of the cover. But she's a woman that I thought I knew a great deal about, <coughs> excuse me, because I used to be the site director of her house in Philadelphia. But Sam Snyder, who has been promoted down to Mount Vernon's reference librarian, has done phenomenal research, including digging in where sources we didn't think we had them, and really looking at this woman who was a major political player in the founding of the nation, whose house was confiscated by the British during the occupation of Philadelphia, and who becomes uh, what one visitor calls la doma figura of uh, the federal city. And really, you know, if we talk about women just being in backgrounds or in corners or tea parties, Elizabeth Powell used what she had available and, and did so in brilliant ways. And maybe, I, I don't think she would hit me too hard for saying this, Anne Bay, who is significantly uh, further along in her career, did phenomenal work on the woman who really, I think is the reason not only that we have Mount Vernon now, but we that we had no George Washington, and that's Anne Pamela Cunningham. I'm sorry, Pamela Ann Cunningham. I always do that, get her name scrambled. Who was in every way a woman who was supposed to not be a player. She was uh, an invalid. She was a single woman. She was uh, a, a Southern matron, as she liked to call herself, whose mother saw Mount Vernon literally about to tumble down the hill in the Potomac. And Miss Cunningham stepped in and created the first national preservation movement in the United States of America. And she, uh, she had no children, but her daughters uh, thrive. The Mount Vernon Ladies Association is a group of incredibly committed, dedicated, hardworking women, uh, still a group of women uh, who saved Mount Vernon and raised money for it. And I think have funded both Charlene's research and my own during our times as Mount Vernon uh, fellows, and it is a really exciting thing to see this. I would, when I'd be having lunch in the cafeteria at Mount Vernon, periodically you'd run into one of the ladies with their very impressive heraldry uh, uh, on their on the front of their outfits, and I would go up and thank them and for their contributions. They were always very nice and very much fun at the receptions and parties. But these are women from around the nation who still do this, who say, you know, as Miss Cunningham said, the men of America have let Mount Vernon fall to ruin. The women must save it. And I think that's the beginning of historic preservation. You show me a, you know, show me a house museum in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and it was probably founded and maintained by women. The Powell House, where I used to live and work, was founded. Well, by what about you, Charlene? What, um, what women do you think will be most surprising to readers? Well, um, what I really liked is, well, I'll say two things here, right? So we added um, an important category for us was not to just have women who loved George Washington or admired George Washington, right? So, you know, 
there's a chapter on Martha Washington who loved him and Elizabeth Willing Powell who loved him and admired him and Anne Pamela Cunningham who did. But we also included women who frustrated him and challenged him. So George has written an essay about not just Dona Judge, but a number of the enslaved women in the presidential household in Philadelphia. Um, and I wrote a chapter on Peggy Ship and Arnold and how she committed treason and perhaps tried to get George Washington kidnapped by the British, right? Um, and we had, you know, Jim Basker did a wonderful essay on Phyllis Wheatley. And I'm not sure Phyllis Wheatley would automatically come to people's minds when they think about women in George Washington's world. But she wrote these amazing poems about George Washington. George Washington read her poems. He exchanged letters with her. She may possibly have even visited George Washington. So we felt Phyllis Wheatley certainly belonged in, in the book, right? I think Peggy Ship and Arnold belongs in the book. And then the second thing I'll say is even the women you might expect to be in the volume, yes, there's a chapter on Martha Washington. Yes, there's a chapter on Abigail Adams. Yes, there's a chapter on Mary Ball Washington, his mother. But what these chapters did, it's a new way to look at these women. So Lynn Price Robbins, her chapter on Martha Washington, you learn about Martha Washington well beyond just being a wife to Washington, but being a symbol of the American Revolution and a symbol to the Revolutionary War soldiers at what they were fighting for and an infatigable fundraiser for it. Sarah Giorgini at the Adams Papers, her portrait of Abigail Adams and her relationship with George Washington, I think reveals lots of new information, new insights about both of those figures, both George and Abigail, and in how to use Sarah Giorgini's words, they with John Adams and Martha constructed the new presidency. So, uh, you know, I think so Georgie, think? yeah. I think Georgini and Price are perfect examples of the point you made to begin with about you picking the exact right scholar to right. write the essay, uh, you know, sort of irrespective of whether they were working in applied history, public history, right. uh, or academic history. And I think Charlene to to that point about new insights into these women. I think the collection achieves that. And I think it goes beyond that because it offers new insights into the 18th century and the revolutionary age, which is so often uh, so masculine, you know, like the iconography, um, you know, the, the narratives of the revolutionary era are about you know, like dashing war heroes and intellectuals and, you know, like men in uh, velvet knee breeches. Uh, and that w we've assumed is where the power resides and where the important stories unfold. But readers of this collection are going to discover um, a very different kind of narrative. And I wondered if you all might like just give us a summary of what happens when you look at the 18th century and the revolutionary age from the point of view, points of view of diverse women, rather than, uh, you know, the mythology of the founding fathers. You know, maybe I could jump in a little on that. In the, in the time since I started graduate school over 30 years ago now, I'm always reminded of an interview I watched with one of my favorite historians, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Um, who has said that when she started her book, Good Wives, about women in early New England, that when she went to archives, a lot around, I'm not far from where Martha Ballard, the famous midwife she read about, uh, lived right now, and she said people would say to her, well, you won't find much. And I actually passed my doctoral exams the morning she won the Pulitzer Prize for A Midwife's Tale. I had no impact on that book, but I still remember one of my professors sitting reading the Chicago Tribune and another saying, who won the prize in history? And, uh, and my advisor said, Laurel Ulrich for A Midwife's Tale. And this very old, very traditional historian said, must not have been much published last year. And I was mortified and said, oh, it's a great book. You know, it's a, uh, her, her work has always inspired me a great deal. And I think a lot of women like Laurel Fletcher Ulrich, Mary Maples Dunn, um, Mary Beth Norton, Linda Kerber, and others really looked out over a wasteland and helped us discover these incredible stories, these lives, these voices. If the role of a historian is to make us smarter, 
about the past than we were when we started. And they really laid cornerstones. And I was very uh, fortunate to get to work with each of those at some point in my time at the McNeil Center. Um, I think Charlene is probably far better versed on what's coming next, although I've certainly had an education in the couple of years of producing this book. Um, well, I mean, what I think readers will learn from, from the volume about women is that you can't tell the story of the revolution without them. Um, you can't talk about the founding of the nation without considering women's experiences. And so women, and Loria has heard me say this innumerable times, and she agrees and her own work shows it, right? Women weren't passive spectators or just occasionally showing up like, you know, Betsy Ross or Molly Pitcher, right? Women were everywhere. And it seems really obvious to say that, um, but the kind of ideas of how we think about the revolution in spite of Linda Kerber's work, in spite of Mary Beth Norton's book, still wants us to think of the velvet knee-bridged men in Philadelphia signing the Declaration of Independence or the soldiers who you know, fought for the British. And we don't want to set all of that aside with our volumes. What we want to do is bring women into that central story, make them strong actors which they were, right? Every single contributor to this volume, and Cynthia Kerner's brilliant introduction about the women at Trenton welcoming George Washington, make it abundantly clear how strong of actors women were, um, both in terms of being committed to the war effort, either as loyalists or as patriots, um, both making, all, all these women made choices about what to do for themselves, what to do for their family. They were all active. Um, none of them just sat there and watched the revolution go by. And the other thing that's really important when you bring women into the center of the story and you're essentially rewriting the history of the revolution, and this is the thing I learned a lot working with this volume, is that freedom and independence mean lots of different things when you look at women than when you look at men and at the men's experiences and the stories that have been told by men. And so we get a much more complicated view of history. I always tell my students, history is complex and messy. And this volume does that. It makes the history of the revolution more complex and more messy. Um, you know, just like your recent work, Lori, on, on Eliza Lucas Pinkney. You know, I think of Lori when you describe Eliza Lucas Pinkney as a planter patriarch, right? Using those male terms to describe a woman, um, you know, that's the reality of her life. And that's what we're all trying to do with this work as well. Right. So Eliza was a, a an 18th century South Carolinian. And I did make the interpretation in the biography that she was for all practical purposes, a planner patriarch. I got some pushback from other scholars about that. Um, but in every way that uh, mattered in 18th century South Carolina society, she exercised power. She, you know, she was a commercial planter on a, a sort of international scale. She enslaved scores of people. She managed multiple uh, estates. Um, and she was a contemporary of George and Martha Washington. And when, when I read Martha Washington's um, writings about th those sort of brief writings between the death of her first husband and her um, remarriage to George Washington. And when I read Lynn Price's work, I see a lot of connections between Eliza Lu Lucas Pinckney uh, and Martha Dandridge Custis. Like she was a very confident, self-possessed, capable leader uh, of, uh, of a complicated estate. And that's not often the image that we have of Martha Washington or of uh, 18th century women more generally. Right. And if you add Mary Thompson's chapter that looks at Martha Washington and other of her kinswomen, her white kinswomen, and their interactions with their enslaved people in Mount Vernon, again, you get another picture, another a different kind of picture about Martha Washington to think of her not just as the wife of the founding father, right? Um, but as somebody who was skillful in her negotiations with her enslaved people and, and certainly every bit 
a part of that plantation as George Washington was. I've sometimes heard people say that Washington, uh, maybe because of the relationship with his mother, was drawn to particularly strong, capable women like uh, Martha Dandridge Custis, like Abigail Adams, uh, like uh, Elizabeth Willing Powell. And I, that might be true. But then I also wonder if there are just more confident, strong, capable 18th century women than, than we've been, um, you know, willing to to um, to accept. Let me back up for a second and ask about uh, something that, that George brought up when he talked about Laurel Ulrich's work. Um, and that's the amount of material that's available. So the National Archives has for decades funded major papers projects uh, for the leading male figures in the revolutionary era. And those are now available uh, through founders.archive.gov, which your contributors all used. Um, so there are tens of thousands of letters on that website, to and from Washington, Hamilton, Jefferson, Adams, uh, you know, all so on and so forth. Uh, but your um, contributors, for the most part, did not have that kind of wealth of material to draw on, like firsthand accounts from individuals about their lives or the sort of historical context. So can you talk a little bit about the um, the imaginative research that was done in some of the essays and how women's lives get pieced together um, uh, in the 18th century? It's still amazing to me uh, from my generation that the, the bound volumes have now become, the founders' papers are online, the, the, sorry, the male founders' papers are online. And I think we all have a responsibility now um, to get organizations pushing and, and backing uh, women's papers projects. Um, one of my public history roles is as the director of the Remember the Women project in Philadelphia uh, and raising historical markers to notable women when where there have been few. The next one that will go up this fall will be the, the, about Ona Judge's escape from the president's house. Uh, but um, fortunately, Elaine Foreman Crane years ago, decades ago now, uh, edited and published the papers of, um, oh, I'm having a, I'm having a, uh, Elizabeth Willie, uh, or Elizabeth Drinker, um, which is a phenomenal resource. And I don't think you can write about Philadelphia in the revolutionary period without going to Mrs. Drinker's uh, diary. We need to get, if it's local historical organizations of the, or the Daughters of the Revolution or whoever behind these, and get a good grants person involved and raise the funds. And it's a great way to employ some graduate students the way Mary and Richard Dunn did the papers of William Penn starting in the 80s. Um, but I think this is something we have to say, okay, we're at that moment now. We have to get these more accessible. Um, our authors in this volume, I think in many ways, we're still doing work that required slogging into archives, small and sometimes very large, like the U.S. National Archives, uh, and getting to their papers. Um, I have teased Charlene a great deal because she has done phenomenal work looking at a woman who I was only introduced to by a Brady Bunch episode in the early 70s. Uh, uh, but there are still shippings all over Philadelphia, of course. Um, and the narrative Charlene came up with of this woman who may have really played George Washington. You know, she may, have, uh, she may have been the one who really pulled the wool over his eyes, which we don't like to think of that happening to George Washington. He's like everyone's favorite uncle, but, um, but she beat him at that moment. I, 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 I don't think Charlene is arguing. Um, my own path to my essay came very late when I wanted to do a piece on the women of the of the president's household, the, the two women who Martha Washington brought to Philadelphia in slavery, and why and how the city of Philadelphia might have affected uh, their lives, including Ona Judge's decision to walk out the door of the president's mansion at Sixth and Market and never go back. And George and Martha Washington did perhaps the most unethical thing he did in his career in trying to use the power of the presidency for his own personal financial gain, which is um, but uh, I decided to write this essay right as COVID hit 
My plan was to go back to Mount Vernon for March and April of 2020, and we can all remember we didn't go anywhere in March and April of 2020, but I was incredibly lucky that the National Park Service then has amassed a very large archive related to the President's House Historic Site, which is their latest developed interpretation, uh, allowed me to use that. And because I'm a registered volunteer with the Park Service, Chief Curator Kerry Deathorn allowed me to go in and sit in the closed library by myself in a mask, reading the papers collection amassed by a historian who's just retired named Anna Cox Toogood. And I was incredibly lucky in that regard. And as Charlene knew, she made me tone down my footnotes, which ran for pages. Um, there's been a lot of great scholarship in recent decades. And I don't know, when, when we were students, I know I'm a bit older than the rest of the panel, but um, that, that scholarship wasn't there. We were told, you know, you won't find much, don't go looking. Uh, and it's really incredible. I think Ona Judge now is and should be a household name. Um, well, and that's what a lot, you know, myself included, and a lot of the other authors in the volume you know, we're already familiar with how difficult it is to do women's history and how you have to sift through as much as you can to find women's voices. Um, so those, all of those thousands and thousands of letters by men aren't useless when you're doing women's history. You just have to read them really carefully and you have to find the sentence or two um, that references their wife or their daughter or an enslaved woman who's causing them problems. Um, it's often near the sale. It's often near their signature where they'll add something about a woman in their family, or you have to look at account books differently, right? And you can find women there. Um, Cindy Kerner did a wonderful job of analyzing Courier and Ives images of Washington's visit to Trenton to talk about the women in Trenton and how in the Courier and Ives images, images, they're faceless, they're nameless, what does that mean, right? And it's a real kind of symbol of women's history that they're mainly nameless and, and faceless and we have to go digging for them. But all of our contributors were very sophisticated at doing that and also knew how to, you know, how do you flip sources? How do you read between the lines? Um, I think Jim Basker looking at Phyllis Wheatley's poetry for both, what does this tell us more about what this young enslaved woman was thinking about the person who was fighting the Revolutionary War and her influence on him. You know, you could lose Phyllis Wheatley in all of the George Washington stuff, and yet he pulls her out. Um, similarly, Kate Hallman did the same thing with Mary Ball Washington, right? She doesn't really tell the biography of her. Instead, she looks at how the 19th century remembered her. And we learn a lot about women. Um, and we learn a lot about Mary Ball Washington in how these men and women in Fredericksburg, Virginia wanted to remember the mother of the father. So it requires creativity, um, material culture helps, right? Um, and just learning how to sift, how to read between the lines, how to look at things differently. It's the joys and, and the, the difficulties of doing women's history. So, Charlene, I think one of the best examples of sifting and flipping comes in your piece on Peggy Ship and Arnold. So can you just briefly tell viewers like what people thought they knew <laughs> about the the Arnold episode and what they can learn if they're willing to read more carefully and think more critically from Peggy's point of view? Right. Well, much of what we know about Benedict Arnold's treason focuses on Benedict Arnold. And I decided to bring her in, bring Peggy Arnold, his wife, in more into the center of the story. And there's lots of discussion about how involved she was. Some historians say, you know, it was all her fault. She was the one that lured Benedict. Others say, no, no, she's completely innocent. She had nothing to do with it. And there they agree with Alexander Hamilton and George Washington that she had nothing to do with it. And I thought, okay, let's actually go back and look at the sources from the time, what remains, what's there. And one thing I learned is that most historians who write about this just rely on historians from the 19th century who didn't have all the evidence. Um, the, British side of the correspondence wasn't revealed until the late 1930s, wasn't published until the 1940s. 
That British correspondence makes it abundantly clear that Peggy Shippen Arnold was very much involved in it. And for some reason, a lot of historians haven't looked, they just don't look at those documents. Similarly, when you go back and you look at how Hamilton remembered the episode, how Lafayette remembered the episode, there's nothing left from Peggy Shippen Arnold from this time period. All of her letters, all, and, and she wrote a lot of letters at the end of her life, so something tells me she wrote a lot of letters during this, but they're all gone, I think purposely disposed of by her family. But when you look at what's there, and you think about, if you come at it as I did, that women are strong actors, women make choices, women make decisions, women aren't passive, you get a whole different picture of Peggy Shippen Arnold involved in the treason. She was certainly a part of it. She certainly helped it along. Lots of people will say to me, well, she was only 18 or 19. Well, their 18 and 19 year olds aren't our 18 and 19 year olds, and we need to remember that. Uh, and so there's, to me, just a logic to it, as well as evidence to it that Peggy was very much involved in this treason. And when we bring her in, it tells us so much more about how even these men acted during the revolution and during the treason. We learn a lot more about how Washington wanted to be considered a gentleman officer when we bring Peggy into to the story of the treason. We learn a lot more about how Hamilton wanted to appear the devoted, you know, um, uh, you know, admirer of his fiance when we bring Peggy into the middle of it. So it's just, and plus it's a great story, right? It's a really good story. And to put her, to put her in the center, to make this a story about Benedict and Peggy, I'll go back to my earlier point, gives us a much truer picture of what happened, um, a much more accurate picture of what happened and teaches us a lot more about the revolution. So both of you are, are very um, experienced, uh, is, is sort of seasoned and prolific historians of the 18th century. And yet you can't, you know, edit a collection of this breadth without just being shocked by something that you've learned. So as you, like thinking about all of the stories that get um, told and reimagined by your authors, what's the sort of single most surprising thing that you learned in the process of uh, of working on the collection? What, what about you, George? Gosh, I, I, coming up with one, I, I mean, I would almost echo what Charlene was just saying. I remember when she presented her paper at the Mount Vernon Symposium, and of course I've edited, I don't know how many times I've read your chapter now, but um, a bunch, uh, you, you get to, it sort of turns into a hum if you've edited something, but this idea that the, the this construction of masculinity and femininity and oh she's just such a pretty little 19 year old oops she committed treason too but she's from such a nice family um you know you can almost hear that conversation going on now you know oh they didn't mean to attempt to assassinate the vice president they were from such nice families what the heck is a nice family um you know i have to say one of the things that continues to shock me is jim masker's complicated uh, work on Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, you know, I I think I was in graduate school at least before I heard of Phyllis Wheatley and I went to a very liberal liberal arts college where her name was just not part of the canon. And it very much is now. We've seen the story was much more complicated. You know, uh, as one person joked a long time ago, we've discovered there used to be women in the 18th century and there were black people too. Um, when my first book was came out, I had someone approach me and say, gosh, for a history of early Philadelphia, there's a lot of black people in this book. And I, why is that? And I said, because indeed there were a lot of black people in 18th century Philadelphia and their stories count too. Um, and so I, I think each of our authors, you know, based on their own steam, their own intelligence, really dug in and came up with things that complement the story we all know, George Washington throwing his false teeth across the Potomac or whatever is your favorite George Washington myth, but, but complicate it and add more voices to the story. Um, as I said to Charlene a few days ago, I tend these days of, of continuing Twitter, uh, continuing COVID lockdown to look at what historic sites are posting about their site and, and respond to it when people attack them for it if it's well done. 
And uh, Mount Vernon has done a phenomenal job of interpreting the history of the Washingtons and the hundreds of other people who lived on that plantation to the general public. It's as good as, as, good as you can get. And uh, someone was, I'll use the Philadelphia word, I'll use the Yiddish and say, was kveshing, saying, oh, one more posting about slavery. And I said, well, slavery was very important to George Washington's plantation. What do you want them to talk about? And he said, I want to know stories about the general. And I said, there are thousands of books. Why don't you go to your local library and read a biography? Um, we've never been at a loss for books about George Washington. There's, in fact, a beautiful library in Virginia now full of books about him. But they come. I, I, I do want to talk about George Washington, but before we pivot there, I want to know from Charlene, what, um, what story shocked you the most? Or surprised you the most? Yes, or did you think, yeah. How did I not know that? Two, two, two things. Um, Samantha Snyder's, we've already brought this up, Elizabeth Willing Powell. I knew of her. I had no idea how incredibly influential she was on George Washington. Um, basically, right, we have her to thank for him being president for a second time. Phenomenal. That I, I, I loved reading about that. The other thing that surprised me was the end of Jim Basker's essay where he says, you know, we can't count out the influence of Phyllis Wheatley on George Washington in his decision to free his enslaved people. I thought that was amazing. Um, to think about that, that this young black poet may have been the reason why George Washington wanted to free his enslaved people was phenomenal. So, you know, this incredibly elite white woman, I found a new thing about and surprised about and then a surprise about an enslaved woman. It was to me, that was the best part of the volume, right, is that even I, who knows a lot about women's history in this time period, could still find and be surprised by things. So I, I kind of cut George off, so I apologize about that, but I, but I did want to um, return to that. Um, you know, the, I, I'm, and I'm Lori Glover, and I'm talking with Charlene Boyer-Lewis and George Boudreau, who are the editors of a fantastic new collection of essays called The Women of George Washington's World. And so far, we've spent our time talking about the important, fascinating range of women that your authors um, wrote about. But the title is The Women of George Washington's World. And so the, the collection coheres around connections uh, to, you know, the first president and the, uh, the father of the country. So what do we learn about George Washington? You know, George, to your excellent point, there are thousands and thousands of biographies uh, of George Washington and tens of thousands of his letters if you want to go straight to the sources. Um, but what do we learn about George Washington by shifting our focus to look at the diversity of women who influenced his life? Well, I, I, I will be uh, uh, maybe a, uh, joking a little bit, but, you know, there's, I always say that a lot of scholarship in the past has been about the lonely founding fathers. They lived in those houses all alone. They sat at dinner every night by themselves. Somehow, we don't know how, but food would magically appear on the table like in Harry Potter. And um, they would die alone and be, occasionally they'd be buried next to some lady. But, um, and I, I, th I think what our responsibility now in the 21st century is complicating that. And it need to be break down the walls. You know, one of the things that's been delightful to see at the Monticello Historic Site in, uh, in Central Virginia, where Thomas, uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, plantation, is now they finally interpreted the other bedrooms in the house, the bedrooms upstairs where his adult daughter was forced, well, was pressured to sleep in a bed she hated because dad thought beds in closets was a great idea. And I can't imagine trying to sleep, it'd be like sleeping in a coffin. And the bedroom downstairs where Sally Hemings raised their children in what, in conditions that Thomas Jefferson's white grandson described as were smoky and uh, kind of dirty. And uh, I was there when the archeologists were working on the site and it's damp. 
Sally Hemings lived a life in a damp little room in the basement. Um, if you're in Philadelphia this week, you are sweltering. There's a reason I'm in Maine. But if you contemplate Ona Judge and Mal and the other seven or eight enslaved persons who lived under the eaves uh, in that house at Sixth and Market, now long, long gone. But if you think about their lives, and, and you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll say that kind of bothers me still is, no matter how much information we dug, and I worked with other historians and such, we have a lot of information now about Ona Judge because she left us the first narrative. She, it is, in some ways, the first president's mentioned narrative that my late friend Lillian Rogers Parks continued when she wrote her book about working Hoover through Eisenhower as an uh, African-American maid in the White House. But we don't know what happens to Mal or Mammy Molly, as the grandchildren call her. I did not allow that term to be used in the book. But we don't know what happens to her. She just vanishes. When Martha Washington dies, she is inherited like a piece of property. The, the way I inherited my grandmother's silverware, one of the Custis grandkids inherited human beings. And even though she was this beloved member of the family, she just vanishes. And mm -hmm. as God is my witness, I'm going to go looking for her when I can go back to Virginia and do research. Well, you know, George, about the, the loneliness thing, it, it, it reminded me of that very poignant letter that George Washington, after he's retired from the presidency, he writes to Tobias Lear. And he says, uh, you know, you can come over. If um, if no one pops in, then Mrs. Washington and I will do something tonight that we've not done for 20 years, and that is sit down to dinner alone. And that letter is often read as a commentary on Washington's long service to the nation and his endless sacrifices, or sort of decades of sacrifices to building the republic. And that's true. But the other thing that's true in that letter is they're not sitting down to dinner alone. That meal, like every meal that was ever eaten at Mount Vernon, was prepared by, the table was prepared by, the, ta the table was cleaned by uh, enslaved people. And so I think that correction of the loneliness narrative and Charlene's point about like mining things a little more closely, as you all were, as you said that, George, it reminded me of that letter and that sort of mythology uh, and, and that erasure. Char Charlene, what do you think we learn about George, George Washington, Washington from the collection? I, I, I think many of us think of George Washington um, as not exactly lonely, but maybe, you know, a sole decision maker, or if he's taking advice, he's taking advice from the men which he would have considered the men in my family, right? Meaning his military family, like Alexander Hamilton of Lafayette. And we think, you know, that that he has, you know, some kin, son, uh, nephews and adopted sons, right, who help him. But what I, I think we learn about George Washington with this volume is how influential women were on his life, on his decision making. Um, the women who loved him, as I said, or the women who frustrated him and thwarted him, they all influenced him. And I think it's really kind of revelatory to think about George Washington, the father of our country, the, you know, the general who won the war, being influenced by women and making decisions because of women. And this volume shows that. Um, that women were everywhere in his life. We can't downplay the economic reality that the only way he got to go off and, uh, and, and become the hero of the revolution was because there were women at home, Martha and the granddaughters, her granddaughters but by her first marriage. And as uh, Mary Thompson, who was Mount Vernon's longtime and spectacular, I was going to say, you know, this work in a lot of ways stands on the shoulder of giants, although Mary is a, a tiny little thing. I, will, I hope she's watching and she's giggling at that because she's significantly smaller than I am, but um, just phenomenal work of getting into the everyday lives. You know, I, I was involved in a debate over Twitter a few months ago where people were saying, oh, it's, you shouldn't call Mount Vernon a plantation. I'm like, well, what do you think it was? Do you think that was someone's country home on a golf course? Which in some historic sites have been thus interpreted, but 
you know, Mount Vernon is a plantation. It's the center of a factory of production going on, of labor, unpaid and slave labor primarily. Um, that as, as Mary Thompson takes us into, you know, there are a bunch of women who serve in this role as the plantation mistress, which is something I think if any of us have thought about it, it's when we were watching a rerun of Gone with the Wind, and it's, you know, Miss Ellen is charming, and she's taking calf's foot jelly to the starving poor nearby, but no one, you know, Martha Washington didn't have to get up in the morning and make her own coffee. And, I, you know, uh, Mary Thompson is another perfect example of how you all brought together exactly the right people um, working on the, the topics that needed to be uncovered. And, you know, people at different stages in their careers doing different kinds of um, historical work. Um, and yet the whole thing uh, sort of coheres very well and is extremely uh, readable. Uh, so, uh, you know, I just want to say kudos to you and to um, Nadine Zimmerly at the University of Virginia Press for um, honoring the commitment you started with to do good storytelling uh, for um, for a broader audience. We're getting sort of near the end of our time, but I did want to ask, uh, I mean, we, we've talked a, a lot about the uh, what's in the book. When I was writing about Eliza Lucas Pinckney, I uh, encountered the story of a woman named Dinah, who in December of 1779, as British troops are moving north uh, toward the eventual occupation of South Carolina, Dinah flees the Pinckneys who have enslaved her. She has a 13-year-old daughter. She has a baby in her arms, and she's pregnant, and she runs into a war zone uh, into the Revolutionary War Zone, because that seems less dangerous to her uh, than remaining with the Pinckneys. And it's her shot at independence. And and then that's all I know. All I have of Dinah's life, the logs of the Pinckneys, and the runaway advertisement that Thomas Pinckney put, took out in the South Carolina Gazette. And so if I could um, conjure a source Mm. Uh, from the 18th century, if I could imagine something and make it real that would change the the way I write about history, I think it would, I would desperately love to have an account by Dinah of what happened next and what happened to her daughter. Uh, and, you know, similar to the Ona Judge interview that was done uh, late, later in her life. So that's my wish. Uh, ha having reflected on all that you have learned about the women in George Washington's world, if you could conjure something, if you could imagine a source and make it real, what would it be? Well, I can, I, one of the great joys of working with the curatorial and architecture staff at Mount Vernon, which are among the best in the business, is you get to periodically go into spaces that the general public can't go into because frankly it could make the house topple and uh, after the general died uh, lady washington moved from their master suite uh, upstairs uh, to be closer to her grandchildren uh, and there she died and late in her life she was seen rereading his letters and throwing them into the fireplace she did not want to be remembered or she didn't want much to be remembered she wanted to be a very controlled narrative uh, which uh, our author Kate Holman has given us uh, great. I'm um, sorry, Lynn Prince Roberts has given us new insight into. Um, I wish I could. I've stood at that fireplace and looked into its very narrow iron depths and thought, oh, for God's sake, someone grab grandma's letters before they burn. Um, because so often women's voice, Sometimes deliberately. I mean, Charlene's now, she always haunts my brain. And now I'm going to be wondering, I wonder if one of the shippings in Philadelphia has a shoebox full of Cousin Peggy's letters. Uh, years ago, my Judy, my, my very dear friend Judith Van Buskirk uh, was talking to um, another colleague who was saying, oh, I found reference to a woman's diary, but it's, um, uh, but it's lost. It's lost to history. And Judy said, oh, I know a member of that family, Al Colin. 
And she did. He says, oh, yeah, it's in, my lo- it's in my safety deposit box. It's not very valuable. It's just a woman's diary from the 18th century. And Judy, who is a wonderful historian of early America, said, why don't we let an archivist take a look at that? And it's now been published. It's a phenomenal piece of work. But so often people are still hear- hearing what Laurel Ulrich heard. Is, well, you won't find much. And so they're not sharing it. So if there is a shipping on this and you have a box of Peggy's letters, or if anyone is watching this from Virginia and you happen to know where Mal, the mammy, uh, ended up, call us. Well, my website. What about, you? what about you, Charlene? What would you love to find? When a couple decades after the revolution was over, right, lots of soldiers decided to publish memoirs. They knew that they had lived through an important time and there was a wonderful public desire for those. So lots of publishers published lots of soldiers' experiences or you know Benjamin Talmud's memoirs. I wish every single woman who was alive during the revolution had published some memoirs. I wish, I wish the desire had been for anybody who had experienced the revolution, not just the soldiers, um, to to have been valued and published, so that we had this, you know, just a cornucopia of voices about their experiences and what happened. Yeah. Um, so, if I could could create that, I would love that to have as many published memoirs from women as we have from men, um, and either in manuscript form or you know in published form. But lots of these men knew it was important and had written it down. And I, I just wish that, that that had happened as well. You know, that's a, maybe a watchword for us right now. Um, we're living through a transformational period in world history. And how many of us are writing narratives of our experiences with COVID or preserving materials? I think, I think in a way, the... Um, The documentation uh, on some level will be um, fulsome because there's the, you know, digital versions of the New York Times and sort of endless materials from uh, the national, uh, you know, health agencies and and such. But the lived experiences, it's so ephemeral. We tweet about it. We write about it on Facebook. um, But but it's not much that um, that is lasting. I'm talking to our our college archivist here at Kalamazoo College. She's having students write and send send in uh, memoirs of their experiences. So she's paying attention. That's good. I'm talking to Charlene Boyer Lewis and George Boudreaux, who are the editors of the new collection Women in George Washington's World. Uh, George is holding up the cover. It's with the University of Virginia Press. It's available for purchase uh, through the UVA Press website, through Amazon, or orderable through uh, your local bookseller. UVA Press has done a really good job of uh, getting the book out. It got a a glowing review uh, in the Wall Street Journal earlier this week. Uh, It's reasonably priced, and it's important. Uh, It's a really important book, I think, for anyone who's interested in learning about women's lives in the 18th century, or anyone who's interested in deepening their knowledge of George Washington uh, and of the founding era. Uh, So it's been a real privilege and a pleasure to talk to George and Charlene. Is there anything, uh, we're sort of near the end of our time, any last thoughts you'd like to share uh, about the experience, uh, about the collection, about the contributors? Just everybody was wonderful. So it it was just a a terrific experience. And thank you, Lori, and thank you, the National Archives. Very much. It's been been a great honor to work with each of them. There wasn't a stinker in the bunch. uh, And uh, and I've learned a lot. And it's uh, it's a gorgeous book. And um, I was going to say, I always remember the words of Barbara Tuckman, will the reader turn the page? And uh, I'd like to th- I've been getting uh, Facebook comments that people are turning pages. Uh, and I'll give a plug to our wonderful interviewer and say, I've spent the last two days sitting on a rock in Maine uh, reading her phenomenal book on Eliza Lucas Pinckney, who I'm guessing most of you don't know who she was. But it is an incredible biography of a woman who, um, and Laura, you dug into tre- tremendous sources. So 
Um, if you're clicking on, over to Amazon right now, buy them both. If you're going to your local bookstore. Yes. <laughs> However you consume books, consume more of them. Uh, every opportunity uh, you get. So, um, again, it's, it's been a great privilege. It was a great privilege to read the book. Um, I think it's fantastic. I highly recommend it. Um, and I've completely enjoyed the conversation, George Thank and you Charlene. All. Thank you. Thank you all. And we'll hope to do an official in-face, face-to-face launch somewhere soon, either in somewhere. Philadelphia, where the Washingtons lived for about eight years, or they also lived for a time in Virginia. Uh, so uh, one of those sites will be doing that. Hopefully when the weather's a little calmer and everyone's back to work. Yeah. But meantime, we can always use the materials through the National Archives online, including founders.archive.gov. A tremendous research resource. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Great seeing you all.